600,000 people were affected by the floods in 2002, and 80 lives were claimed. In the heat wave of 2003, the mortality rate shot up by 20,000, affecting primarily the elderly and vulnerable. Anyone who thinks that climate change is just the dire predictions of a few scientists and environmentalists should just look around them. It's a reality. It is really happening, and it's happening now. Impacts of Climate Change in Europe is a European Environment Agency report based on 22 indicators and authoritative evidence from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. What it shows is that these are not freak occurrences, but the continuously changing pattern induced by climate change. Well, these emissions come from uh, fossil fuel burning for energy production in power stations, in the transport sector for emissions from automobiles, uh, from agriculture, from the plough up of, of uh, carbon rich soils that then releases carbon to the atmosphere, the destruction of forests, which when wood is then destroyed one way or another, decomposes or is burnt. One of the important aspects of glacier decrease in Europe will be that the delivery of fresh water right across Western Europe from the Alps, which are sometimes referred to as the water towers of, of Europe, will decrease because the water towers store this frozen water over the seasons and over the years and then deliver it through snow melt right through the springs and summer. But as the alpine glaciers and snow cover decreases, then precipitation over the Alps is simply falls, runs off, runs off quickly, and becomes much less available for plant use and use in agriculture and use in irrigation. Weather and climate-related disasters doubled during the 1990s. And if our projections are right, over the coming 100 years, we will see Europe rapidly becoming divided into two parts, a northern flood-prone area and a southern area parched of water without enough to keep its agriculture going. Water will become a scarce resource in the southern part of Europe. It will have to be piped in. Desalination plants will have to be built. Whereas in the north, the increased rainfall will definitely lead to flood-prone areas and potentially loss of agricultural production. It may well be that climate change will have beneficial effects in some parts of the world and damaging effects in, in others. But that doesn't mean that the overall effect evens out as somewhere neutral. Because we know from experience that damaging effects in some part of the world can ripple right through uh, the, the global economy and indeed the global political system through migrations of people that are you know, moving away from areas of adversely affected climate, climate change. So the, 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 the closely knit nature of, of the world will mean, I think, that the damaging effects do ripple right through the world economy, and potentially, if we don't take action, uh, have a damaging effect globally. As climate change is a global problem, it needs a response from all countries in the world. That's why, in 1992, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change was adopted. As the convention is rather general in nature, it was felt that more stringent measures were needed. And that's why in 1997, the Kyoto Protocol was adopted. It gives legally binding emission reduction targets to industrialized countries. Now that enough countries have ratified the Kyoto Protocol, including Russia, it will enter into force and the targets included in the protocol will have a legal basis. Well, Europe accepted to reduce its emissions by 8% based on 1990 level. Um, that's not easy. 
because uh, with increased economic growth, the emissions of greenhouse gases always have a tendency to increase. We have an agreement with the car manufacturers, mainly the European ones, but the European ones are also the American ones because they have all sister companies, they are part of the same conglomerates, to improve energy efficiency of cars with 25% over a period of one decade. Now, of course, the costs came up and the fairness debate came up. And so we started discussions with the Japanese and the Korean car manufacturers, and we came to a similar agreement. So that means that the average energy consumption of the car is 13% better over the last five years and is going to increase with another 12% in the, in the next uh, five years. Well, we're expecting emissions to, to increase uh, from their current position uh, by several hundred parts per million to perhaps eight or nine hundred parts per million with no action taken. But with substantial action taken, we can draw those emissions down to perhaps 750 parts per million. Kyoto is only one very small step, but it's the first step towards that. We have to look at how we're going to adapt. From looking at how we plant trees to meet a different kind of temperature and rainfall regime, to the way in which we grow our crops, and the way in which we protect ourselves from floods and drought, all these become part of an adaptation package that we must now embark upon. The Kyoto Protocol is unique in that it includes mechanisms that allow the industrialized countries to reduce the emissions at the lowest cost. They can take measures at home, but they can also buy emission credits elsewhere. Now, this emissions trading is a very new way of making environmental policy, very new compared to what we did in the past. In the past, we were setting technical standards for products, for installations, while this is uh, giving quotas to companies and allowing them to trade those quotas. This system now is going to start as of the 1st of January of 2005. And with that, we are world leaders in having a market for greenhouse gas emission reductions throughout the EU25. Climate change is a long-term problem, so we must look ahead what needs to be done after 2012, after the first commitment of the Kyoto Protocol. And then, of course, parties have to realize that when the next steps will be effective, then all countries should participate, including those that have now chosen not to ratify the Kyoto Protocol, like the United States and Australia, and that also the developing countries are at the table to look how we can move jointly into the future when more bold steps than the Kyoto Protocol are required to deal with climate change. We're very good at setting targets, but we have to meet them. Over the next 20, 30, 40 years, we have to look out and see what other kinds of targets we need to aim for to bring down the level of carbon in our atmosphere and to halt the fastest change in climate change this planet has ever seen. Oh.